She played in a lot of high school bands mm -hmm. coming up. Of course, Mickey Rat and, you know, all Well, the, before all that, the, the first stuff. band I ever joined when I was uh, 16, 15 or 16, was a country band hmm. that did gigs on the Navy base, and, and they needed a, a, a lead player. And so the first band I was in was Country and Western. And uh, the band after that that I joined was a, a funk band with horns mm. and everything. And uh, I mean, I love all kinds of music. And, mm. and I, I think it's a, a shame when people narrow their horizons into a, this, I only like this. I only like, well, say I only like metal. Yeah. If you only like metal, then I only like black metal. Or, <laughs> you know, to be so specific, you're just ignoring all these other colors, all these other flavors that can add to you and make you unique. Uh, Shallow roots. Yeah, if, if you only listen to one thing, then eventually you're gonna sound like that one thing. And what uh, the most interesting music is, I always brought this and that, a little bit of this. You mixed it up. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's another thing I'm kind of missing in today's music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I listened to radio, you could hear Santana, then Sly and the Family Stone, mm -hmm. then Led Zeppelin, uh, Crosby, Souls, Nash. You, you hear a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I can appreciate loving one style. I mean, when Sabbath came out, I remember I, I was like, oh my God, I just love this. And if I could just listen to nothing but stuff like that, I probably would have. But that wasn't an option back then. And, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I was, I did, to hear Sabbath, I had to hear all these other bands in front of that on the radio. And that was a good thing. And, and I think that's, I mean, back then you would never confuse Santana with Eric Clapton, uh, with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, they all had unique, personalities in their plane and and I don't even know this if this is what you're looking yeah, for yeah. In this, but this is stuff that I've thought about and today if you're a guitar player I like I just pick up the guitar okay I'm learning I got the basic technique down now I'm gonna focus on this one little narrow thing that I like I'm gonna go on the web oh look here's how to play it now you have 10,000 guitar players learning how to play this riff exactly how it's showed to them on the web. Now you got 10,000 guitar players playing that riff exactly the same way. Whereas when I was growing up, and I, God, I don't want to sound like an old geezer, but you know, you had a record. You wanted to learn a lick, you put the needle down, try to figure it out, uh, pick the needle up, put it back down, and what's cool about that, or even learning a song, uh, you get together with other, the other guitar players, like get in a room with four other guitar players. Say, how do you play this song? We'd all played it differently, because that's how we heard it with our limited resources. But because of that, we all played it uniquely. You wouldn't confuse me with him. Now, with everybody going to the same source, the internet, you have a bunch of guitar players that learned it exactly the same way. You have a bunch of guitar players that sound the same. I'm just saying. Sure. And that and that'll probably get me a whole bunch of shit. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> But that's, I don't that, care. That's what we love. It's, we gotta get back to the real, the real playing, the real feeling, you know. Uh, that. Let's just touch on briefly as we move to the new album, um, getting the call. Getting a call from Dana to audition for Ozzy. I mean, oh. what's your greatest memories of that? that period, because I know George Lynch had the gig, and, you know, just give us a little snippet of your, your greatest memory of that call um, and step up. Well, it was it was uh, very surprising, because I, I think there was, was it 10? I think there was 10 guitarists that Dana uh, lined up, the 10 best in L.A., or the 10 best that might suit Ozzy anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, yeah, he just he, he he had each of us come in, and it was very loose. It was uh, he took a Polaroid. Hmm. There was your picture, and he say, "Okay, 
put a mic in front of the cab, say, play something fast. That was basically the direction. Play something fast. All right. Okay, play something uh, ballad-like, like a slow ballad. And then now just play some whatever you want to play. And we had like a, uh, maybe five minutes once it was condensed down to about five minutes of playing time. And he sent all of them to Ozzy. And I just did it because I, I really had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, I'd, if at that point I'd been committed to a band, I, I probably wouldn't even have auditioned. But the fact was I had just quit Rough Cut and there wasn't any, I didn't see any opportunities coming up quickly and and so I said why not I'll do it sounds like fun so mm -hmm. he sent the ten of them and uh, he got Lynch he, he picked Lynch first um, although from my understanding Lynch was offered the first gig before Randy and I've heard this from a couple people I think Ozzy told me that too is, is uh, he wanted George to be in Blizzard of Oz and George uh, was told by his management that Dokken was about to blow up and he'd be a fool to play for a guy that Black Sabbath fired for being a drunk. You know, why throw your career? So George stayed with Dokken mm -hmm. and Randy got the gig. Randy was like his second choice. Um, so he already had an in. So Ozzy picked George first and he took him out on the road with him. And uh, he was doing the uh, sound checks. Are you guys done yet? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. sure. <laughs> That's why there's a camera point. Uh, he, he got the gig, basically, or so I thought, and so did the other, you know, eight guys. Um, but I guess uh, there was just something that uh, Ozzy wasn't absolutely thrilled about with him. And he wanted to try out two more guys, me. And uh, Mitch Perry, who was Mitch Brownstein at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, he had us come down to SIR, and we auditioned, and yeah, I just out, it, it was out of the blue. I mean, I, I was sure I didn't have that gig. I wasn't even sure if I wanted it, but once I was offered it, I decided I did. <laughs> <laughs> so the call came in and kind of changed your life, and. I understand you, you collaborated a lot with Bob Daisley? Yeah. Was you and Bob really vibed in the... For Bark at the Moon. Yeah, yeah. process of recording or writing? Yeah, for writing. Yeah. Because uh, uh, we did... When I joined the band, Don Costa was playing bass. Uh, I don't even know whatever became of him. Hmm. He was a good bass player. Kind of a mm -hmm. weird person. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he was playing bass, and uh, Tommy was on drums. And uh, for the US Festival, Ozzy fired Don and got Bob Daisley back in the fold. And uh, Bob's, Bob's a great bass player, great bass player. After that, we uh, holed up in, um, I think it was Palm Springs, and just, uh, he, he got a rehearsal place. We all just would jam and he'd ask for ideas. So I think the first one I showed him was uh, Bark at the Moon, the riff. And he said, yes, yes, that'll be the title song. Because mm -hmm. Ozzy, Ozzy thinks along the lines of, or at least he did back then, album titles, song titles, he comes up with them before he even hears any music. Mm -hmm. And he said, ah, Got Bark of the Moon's the next record. That's the song. That's Bark of the Moon. And I was like, oh, okay. So he would do that. He'd, he'd sing a little bit, come up with a melody, and then he'd basically go off and get drunk <laughs> mm -hmm. and 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 Daisley and I would stay behind and say okay I've got this much where should it go from there we'd make a song out of uh, riff ideas that I had mm -hmm. uh, most of the riffs and I initial ideas were mine and then me and Bob would figure out how to make that into a, a song musically and uh, then we present it to Ozzy and Ozzy would he came up with uh, a majority of the melody if not all he, he would come up with the melody and the song title and then leave it to Bob 
to uh, come up with lyrics, like for, this is called Park of the Moon. And then Bob would have to figure out how to lyrically write a song about barking at the moon, mm-hmm. which right. Bob is a genius mm-hmm. at doing. Uh, you know, that, uh, thank God, for, I remember when we did Thank God for the Bomb, which is on the next record, Ultimate Sin, mm-hmm. uh, this is going to be called Thank God for the Bomb. <laughs> I'm looking at Bob, like, how are you going to make a song out of something as silly sounding as that? But he did. You know, Thank God for the Bomb equalizes everybody. Nobody wants to go to war anymore because we'll kill each other. Hey, Bob's a genius mm-hmm. as far as, as lyrically. Yeah. And and I know that he wrote the lyrics for the two Blizzard. Well, I don't know that, but I can tell. And he said it and a lot of other people. He wrote the lyrics for the first two albums. He wrote the lyrics for the two albums I was on. And I, I'm pretty sure he wrote the lyrics for the next one after that. Lyrically, Daisley's the man responsible for that. Mm-hmm. Musically, it's always been the guitar player, as far as I know. At least it was when I was in the band. And uh, Ozzy comes up with uh, most of the melody. Mm-hmm. And yeah. song title. Now stepping in there and, and playing Randy's songs, what, 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 what is the legacy that Randy left? What, what do you see his place in history? Obviously the, the solos, the, the material was uh, enormous, but having to step in there and play those songs, what, what, what do you say about Randy? Oh, he was, he was an amazing guitar player. I, uh, uh, compositionally, uh, he, he, I mean, he was, he was very advanced. It was, it was almost classical in, in, mm-hmm. in style, but in a rock mode. And uh, compositionally, he was, he was great. Uh, solo-wise, he was great. He, he was able to, he had this great technique and still a lot of feel. The thing that I, I'm always like, you can have great technique as yeah. long as you got that feel. He would have that feel. And, and the way he, he phrased and, and his melodic sensibility when, when doing solos, he was, he was an awesome guitar player. And, and I, I don't mind admitting that I was, I was very intimidated trying to fill his shoes and at first and then eventually I just said get thinking about it <laughs> it's not gonna help right you know god Randy was really good mm, <laughs> just forget Randy and and I just do as good, well as you can that's yeah. that's how I had to deal with it now bring us full circle here Red Dragon Cartel what what was the feeling to to want to come back and make music again what what is it about this collaboration and, and, and this band that really made you want to get back into it? Well, I, I know the exact moment when that happened because when I was first approached by uh, Kevin Churko and Ron Mancuso, it was, uh, do you want to do something? And I, I didn't particularly want to do anything. I, I figured, I always figured I was lucky. I had a good run. Um, don't need to overstay my welcome. If, if nobody wants to hear anything I have to do, then fine. I did pretty well uh, in the amount of time that I did do stuff. And uh, they wanted to know if I wanted to make a comeback. or I, I pretty much resigned myself to uh, not doing that. You know, uh, I don't want to be the guy that, like, after so many years, after having a, a, a career that peaked here, I didn't want to like come out and like, hey, look at me again. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Um, but th- they made it very uh, casual and they said, look, just write some songs, record some stuff, see how it feels. Mm. And you know, I couldn't argue with that. Oh yeah, sure, why not? I had no big hopes and I, told, I promised them nothing. I said, look, I'll try it out, see what happens, but uh, it's not, it's not a big uh, goal of mine to resurface. And um, so we were doing that, Ron and I, uh, we wrote, the first song we wrote was uh, Feeder. And uh, upon listening to it, 
it occurred to me that Xander, Robin Xander would sound great on it. And, and through circumstance, uh, he ended up singing on it. And uh, the first time I heard that song, um, you know, a song we'd just written and with Robin Xander on vocals, it, uh, it was a pivotal moment because I didn't realize just how much I missed it. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the spotlight or, or the uh, attention. I hadn't realized how much I missed collaborating with people. And, and making music and, and having a song blossom because of the other people involved, it, it, uh, it was exciting. It was, uh, I, I was so taken aback. I mean, I just, I, until that moment, I didn't realize how much uh, life it gave me. Mm -hmm. to do that and um, that's that's when I realized that god damn it I miss <laughs> this I really miss this and uh, and that's when it became a full-fledged project so it helped that it was kind of organic no nobody pushed you into it it wasn't a master of scheme it was just yeah step at a time and then once you cross that threshold you really yeah, it was very organic. I'd, yeah. I'd been offered, who knows how many times, a, a lot of gigs uh, during my retirement. Um, a lot of gigs, a lot of, a lot of offers uh, as far as, and it, it's a popular thing to do these days, is get this 80s guitar player, get this 80s bass player, get this 80s drummer, uh, get an 80s uh, sort of pseudo super groups. Mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. Uh, I'd been offered a lot of those, and it just never sounded appealing. It was always, it seemed like a, a very corporate decision, like this name with this name with this name will uh, sell to this many people. We can all make money. And music's never been about money for me. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, that would be making something I consider sacred into a whore. <laughs> basically sure and I, I it never interested me it's not like I was uh, you know some kind of strong personality that no I will not do that it just never even occurred to me to whore out what I thought was the most precious thing other than my daughter of course <laughs> uh, in my life so uh, yeah I don't even remember what the question was. Yeah. Well, what are, what are you most proud of, you know, on, on the album? Now it's in the can. It's going out to the world. Whether it's the songs, the attitude, the, the feeling. What, what are you most proud of looking at this album? Uh, that it's a of the moment. Uh, there is no preconceptions. There is no preconceived uh, uh, goals as far as I was concerned on this. I didn't you know, go in there thinking, I need to please my old Aussie fans, if there is any, uh, mm -hmm. my old Badlands fans, if there is any. Uh, I need to make a mark in, in modern rock music. There is, there is nothing, there is no goals, really, other than just to make a really good music album. That, that was the only goal, and... And I, I think that it's been accomplished. I don't, uh, I don't suspect that it will please everybody. I mean, you can never please everybody. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think uh, there's going to be diehard Badlands fans that, oh, it's so organic and so raw and, and bluesy. I'm sure there's a faction of those that will listen to the album and go, oh, what the fuck? There's going to be the Aussie fans uh, wanting guitar pyrotechnics and, and uh, uh, they're going to say, oh, I don't like this either. Um, and there's going to be people who hear it and think it sounds uh, more modern than what they expected from me. But it's, it's only because it's 
2014. I mean, I'm not living in 1988, nine, seven, six, pick your year. Mm -hmm. I'm not still living there. It is 2014. And despite that, I mean, a musician is supposed to progress or, or at least uh, do something. He can't stagnate. He can't just be this and be this forever. If he is, then uh, I feel sorry for that musician because it's, it's, God, why do something over and over and over again? Um, Expand your horizons, <laughs> you know, and and it's that's what I'm most proud of for, with this record. It, it sounds to me like music that Jake E. Lee is making in 2014, mm -hmm. not 1983, not 18, 1989, especially not 1890. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's you live, you experience shit. Stuff changes. You shouldn't be playing exactly the same kind of music you were playing 30 years before. It, yeah. it should reflect life experiences and, and, yeah, basically. Sure. And what advice would you give to that young guitarist or that young band coming up today? What do they need to concentrate on to really find their own style or sound and to stand out? Ah, well, basically to have um, that attitude where where you don't compare yourself to somebody. Uh, anytime you compare yourself to somebody, you're, you're on a losing thought. I mean, just uh, to be unique, but not to not to actually pursue. I want to be unique. I want to be unique, because then. That seems to be open to everything and let every little experience, every music, every flavor, every color be a part of your music, your guitar playing, um, and not care what is currently in favor. Because it, it's, to me, music is, is a, it's, it's a very personal thing. It's a very spiritual thing. And it's, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want, I just want it and me to have this relationship where nobody else matters. There, that's, that's what I'm trying. Nobody else matters, nothing else matters. It's just the music with no influence as far as how it's going to be received or, or how many people you can draw into the club or buy your CD. Just very of, of yourself. And if you're honest enough with that and talented enough, you, can, you do have to have the talent then in a perfect world, you'll thrive. And in, <laughs> it's not a perfect world. Mm -hmm. You might not thrive, but that shouldn't be your reason for doing it in the first place. It should be more than just how, how much money you can make doing it. So I think somewhere in there is entailed my advice.